Hello, welcome back in the studio at EPFL in Lausanne. I'm really happy to introduce the last part of today's of today's uh, session, and it's going to be this panel discussion, which we are all excited about: new space enabling agile space logistics, which is going to be moderated by our partner Euroconsult with my great friend Maxim Puto. Maxim, it's now your turn. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, it looks so. Yeah. So, uh, welcome everyone for uh, for this last panel of the day, uh, titled "New Sp uh, New Space Sustainable Logistics." We had great presentation earlier today, thanks to Professor De Wake, which introduced um, space logistic history, and Klaus uh, Dorman from DHL, which introduced um, logistic um, from an Earth from point of view. Um, and during the next uh, 45 minutes, we will discuss how players are actually setting, setting up the building blocks of a sustainable space logistic uh, supply chain. And we are light uh, and we'll uh, discuss several topics, such as the status of the supply chain, how um, the players are, cr are trying to create a sustainable ecosystem, and where are the uh, market opportunities, but also uh, challenges. And, for this discussion, I'm very excited to uh, welcome uh, different panelists um, from different companies with different backgrounds and from different parts of the world, but also different planets, it looks like <laughs> Jeremy and Luca are in orbit. So uh, today we are I'm really happy to have uh, to host uh, Luca Rossettini, CEO and founder of uh, The Orbit. Uh, Jeremy is skill um, co-founder and chief development officer of Orbit Fab. Um, Juice Van Turen, um, space logistics service manager from Ariane Group, and, uh, and uh, Jason Forshaw, head of future uh, business, uh, European business at Astroscale. So for the next uh, 30 minutes, uh, we will discuss around um, um, some uh, some to some topic that we just uh, uh, just introduced, and then we will welcome a question from the audience. So do not refrain yourself to ask question through the chat uh, window. Uh, Emmanuel and Vincent, we will follow up the, them uh, to me and to our panelists. So just looking, uh, trying to uh, share uh, the screen. Uh, I I likely need um, the the uh, authorization from you, uh, Vincent or Emmanuel. But share 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 content. Uh, okay, just okay. Um, just to set a, to setting up um, the. Um, the conversation at Euroconsult, we uh, follow uh, the satellite. We've been following the satellite industry for the last uh, thirty years, and just um, in few figures, um, um, the highlight of uh, what, uh, what has been launched uh, over the last year, uh, we reached um, a world record number of uh, one thousand two hundred and seventy-four uh, five satellites uh, launched in one hundred and fourteen launches, and with a significant boost compared to. A previous year, mainly uh, driven by the rise of constellation, but uh, with um, with uh, SpaceX uh, Starlink constellation and other constellation aside, with there there are also different uh, very interesting um, uh, maiden demonstration happening. Um, just to name a few of them, such as a first flight of a D orbit ion. Um, CubeSat dispenser on one end and on the other end, the first uh, servicing mission uh, in GEO with uh, the successful docking uh, of uh, MEV uh, to <laughs> that uh, 101. Uh, um, and looking uh, forward, we see, we see, uh, we see uh, um, the peak, uh, the threshold of uh, 100 and, and uh, 1,200 satellites uh as a yearly average uh depending on the replenishment cycle of the industry and uh, space logistic uh, wise there are a lot of um, new mission happening either on the launch side such as with the iron 6 uh, maiden flag next year or um, other demonstration either for uh with regard to the destination like first commercial landing on the moon next year or first the um, techno demonstration such as uh, Orbit Fab um, uh, first launch uh, of its uh, fuel tank, or um, even in coming weeks, the Jason, uh, the first launch of Astroscale um, 
Elsa D um, to, uh, to demonstrate active debris removal uh, concept. And with this being said, when we talk about space logistics, I'm looking uh, to hear from my, my distinguished panelists about, in your view, what are the uh, what is the biggest driver of space logistics? Is it about flexibility? Is it about resiliency, cost reduction, empowerment, or other? Jason, if you want to start. Yeah, sure, absolutely. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that uh, great introduction and, and the, the, the wonderful presentations we've had beforehand. Um, just to answer this very quickly, I, I think there's really two key drivers. Um, one is the sustainability driver, I would say, and that's for a lot of you know, future services such as end of life or active debris removal. I mean, according to ESA statistics, you've you've had about 6,000 satellites that are, that are presently in space about which only half are still functioning. If you can imagine, there's about nine, 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 nine thousand tons of space debris up there. I mean, there's a real threat here to the future of space sustainability and even to space logistics itself itself. So I think, you know, that that's one of the key drivers sustainability. But I mean, the, the other side, I would say, is is the kind of the purely the business case driver. Um, and, and that's driven by desire to perform more complex operations in space. I mean, if you take a look at the recent NSR report, they're predicting that in the next uh, 10 plus years, it's a $6.2 billion industry. So I would say those are two of the main areas, really, sustainability and, and the pure business case driver into new areas. Interesting. Lucas, what are your thoughts about this? Oh. Okay, now I can talk. Uh, thank you. I also I also appreciate that really how this uh, this event has has been organized. Very interesting topics, and thank you for inviting me here. So so in terms of uh, of drivers, well, I I think uh, I mean if I have to pick one, I would add one that is enabling uh, enabling factor uh, that pretty much have an impact on all the the item that you highlighted here. Because uh, basically, uh, logistics will enable uh, all the customers, satellite operators, and space users to change the business models. So today, satellite operators are doing their business because they are forced to use the, the infrastructure that is available today. Uh, but tomorrow, they can really change business model, going in place where today they cannot optimize the current business, changing the capex that actually it's one of the you know, main issue of the space sector into OPEX, extract more revenues because as uh, it was said in the previous panel, uh, speed is one of the main aspects. You want to be delivered as fast as possible where you need to operate. And, uh, and especially, I mean, not, not just make more revenues, but also make revenues earlier uh, because most of the companies in the new space are venture backed. And uh, using private money, you need to be fast, not only to build your business, but also to provide a return on the investment. So, so enabling factor, enabling aspect of space logistics. Interesting. What about you, Just Curious to hear about uh, yeah. Ian Group's point of view on this one. So clearly, uh, I agree with what was set up to now. Um, I would say, uh, from our point of view, the, the most interesting point is the flexibility. Uh, it is about flexibility in integrating new types of customers, new types of satellites. Uh, in the past, uh, if you were five tons and wanted to go to GEO, then, 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 then there was a clear offer. Today, uh, space logistics is clearly requiring a flexibility in what has to be offered uh, from small satellites to big satellites to direct injection. Uh, to um, multiple forms of ride share. So for me, it's really a, it's a mix of flexibility and cost reduction, which will be the biggest driver of space logistics, such that more people can benefit from the use of space and not just, I say, a few, selected few uh, specialists. Speaking of ride share, I'm curious to, um, to hear about Jeremy's point of view, since we will, you will uh, deploy your first satellite uh, this year on a ride share. What are what are orbit fab views, Jeremy, on this question? Well, in my term, my point of view, the biggest driver for space logistics. We we can barely hear you, Jeremy. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Very uh, poorly. Yeah. If you can just increase the volume of your of your mic. Can you hear me better now? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, so the biggest driver of space logistics from my point of view is actually mobility and mobility derived by refueling. Uh, you know, even with, service, with space logistics today, we're all stuck in that single use paradigm where you go up with your one tank of fuel, you use it, and then you burn up your asset uh, or it becomes junk, right? And, you know, most of the time, the technology on that uh, is still good. And, and when you're talking about space logistics missions, whether it be active debris removal, uh, life extension, uh, orbital transfers, a lot of these require mobility uh, in a short amount of time so you can go meet with, you know, various customers. And if you don't have that fuel network, if you don't have that mobility, you're, it's almost like, you know, when you're, when you're in a small town and there's not really many roads to get out of it, you kind of just stay in your, your little ecosystem. And, and right now the space industry is at the point now where we're starting to expand, you know, beyond the traditional communications earth observation, right? So with, with servicing, you know, you really need that mobility, that Delta V to be able to go and service as many customers as you can. Speaking of mobility, I'm interested to hear the, um, uh, all, from all of you, what are your views uh, on regard, with regard to standardization, either for the standardization of protocol, um, of interfaces, either for refueling or for docking or just for, for deployment? How, how uh, critical is uh, standardization for the success and the growth of space logistics? So oh, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I personally believe that having standards is, is important. Uh, you know, eventually if we can get to a global standard, that would be great. Um, but you know, that, that requires a lot of collaboration and you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I believe the market should decide, you know, what the standard is, right? Mm -hmm. We want to keep, especially in the early years, we want to keep that competitiveness so we can have the best interface moving forward. You know, if we have a, a government body or something, put forward a standard and say, this is it, uh, you know, you, you could potentially stifle a lot of innovation uh, from the commercial sector, especially with all this private investment coming in, looking for uh, rapid change and, and disruption. Uh, you know, also being vice chair of Confers, an uh, in, in industry body where we are working to, you know, look at best practices and standards for satellite servicing or space logistics. Um, but a lot of that's looking around like how you approach spacecraft, the op the con ops, the concept of operations, you know, what, what are some basic things that we can do? Um, and, and it's something that we actively look for new members, you know, from around the world, because we really do want this to be a, a global community trying to figure out what the best type of standard is um, and how we pursue, you know, the space, the space logistics moving forward on a global scale. Yeah, I might. I might add to that as well. Um, I, I think overall, yes, there's the, the standardization in terms of things like best practice from industry. So as mentioned, things like confers, um, I mean, in the UK, we have this UK IOSM working group and you've, you've got a lot of efforts um, looking towards certain standards. So, you know, there's an ISO working group for rendezvous and proximity operations. ESA has their own close proximity operations group. I think it is important to define certain standards in, in key areas, such as proximity operations and, and what is best practice um, in terms of operators interacting with each other in this kind of domain. Um, one area I would say, though, um, is quite key for standardization. I would say uh, entities such as docking plates. And, mm -hmm. you know, we would strongly recommend that a lot of future um, space providers, people, people that launch their, people that have satellites, um, actually building a docking plate to actually open up their opportunities for future servicing. I mean, it, in future, you know, your, your satellite may fail, it may require servicing. And by putting on this very kind of low cost um, docking plate, you can effectively future proof your vehicle. So that's something we're really pushing towards. And I think if there was such a standard on that, that would really help generally, um, because you can imagine if everybody has similar docking plates, then it's well known how you can actually service with um, service such vehicles in future. If I'm correct, this is already a conversation and an, an, an initiative that you started with uh, OneWeb, right? Yeah, so OneWeb has actually committed to putting docking plates on all their first generation vehicles. That's a mix of the LTS and the MDA docking plates. So I, I think they are, um, well, they're one of the largest constellation players in the world. And I think they're kind of showing their forward thinking and sustainability by actually saying, we need to do this. 
that, you know, in case our satellites fail or for whatever reason, there is a dock in place on board. And, you know, we, when we speak to our customers and other operators and, and well, people producing satellites, we, you know, we would really strongly encourage them to, to put dock in place on board as well. Speaking of customer, I'm curious to hear from all of you. Um, what is what is um, the customer profile uh, with the most likely customer profile of uh, space logistic services? And uh, speaking with a very wide scope, uh, is it more government? Is it more um, commercial uh, defense? Um, curious to hear your thought about this. So I can start here. Uh, well. I think it, it really depends on, on the type of, of uh, objective that you want to uh, you, you want to have. So you mentioned defense, uh, uh, government, and, and commercial. So the, if you if you if we stay on the on the commercial, uh, let's say uh, um, area, uh, well, first of all, you want to have a satellite operator with a constellation that is already in place. Um, uh, otherwise, uh, of course, the satellite operator will be busy sending satellites in space. Uh, you know, before it can, if, if it can consider to add other layer of services, but as uh, as uh, like Jason said, some satellite operators are already including some aspects that they are going to use in the constellation when the constellation will be uh, operating. So I think this this is the first one. Uh, the second one, um, satellite operators with a, like a certain size of satellites that they, they do require um, to, to maintain their own orbit, for example, clean. So they cannot mm -hmm. afford for their own business model to have defunct satellites or like not uh, completely working satellites within the same orbit. So they really need to take into consideration that or satellite operators that need to address, um, th they have um, uh, a diversity on uh, market segments that they are addressing. So they need to uh, switch satellites from an, uh, one area to, or, or to, a, uh, or to another one while maintaining the competitiveness of the constellation. Because uh, if you build all the satellites with all the capabilities, they get, uh, they don't have a very long life. So uh, by the end of the life, the satellite is becoming obsolete. So you want to have a mix of satellites with different type of, uh, of technology. So this is the, the commercial profile. Uh, and, and I stop here uh, and then I, I let the floor for defense and government to, to, to the other guys. Once we so, enter a mature market, it will be you know, pretty much everybody above CubeSats. Because once space logistics is a thing, it's going to completely redefine the way we operate in space. Right? No, you, you don't have to launch a big fuel tank anymore. You can just refuel mm -hmm. every few years. You know, if a transponder breaks, you just call up a servicer and they'll pull it out or put a new one in. Uh, so, so it's really at the beginning where we shift away from once I launch something, I can never uh, touch it. I can never change it to, well, you know, if something goes wrong or I want to upgrade something, you know, now I just, there's a company out there that can do that for me in orbit. And, and so, you know, beyond the, the CubeSats for, for demonstrations or, or, or product testing, I, I do believe that most, if not all companies will eventually use some form of space logistics uh, once the market's mature. If we draw a, a parallel with um, um, on Earth uh, logistics, DHL, for example, um, is uh, manage uh, its fleet and coordinate its services, but doesn't build hardware per se. Uh, they are not building their aircraft and so on. How do you um, see uh, yourself with regard to other uh, logistic topics? You are both, all of you are aiming to tackle very um, difficult challenges and with uh, with bold uh, value proposition. You are building first hardware because the hardware doesn't exist. But um, do you see yourself as the one um, managing and organizing the supply chain or is there room for uh, someone, uh, another coordinator on, on space logistics? Well, maybe on that, uh, just maybe just a, a small remark um, on that. Uh, because we discussed standardization before and standardization, it sounds like you have to fit inside a certain box like a cube set or something. But for me, the standardization and I think this is what we'll see is that uh, it's exactly to avoid fixing the customer to a certain pure standard, but having the flexibility and having the standardized processes, sales processes, technical qualification process, 
uh, enabling to accommodate a wide variety of different types of uh, payloads going to different destinations, mixing them within a single mission, for instance. And, uh, this is also clearly, uh, if you look at the multi-launch service from Ariane Spass, mm -hmm. the work is not so much to build a, uh, some kind of ring to host CubeSats. It's really about the standardization to ensure late integration of uh, new customers, because if you're going to be mixing many customers on a single launch, you're going to have uh, people falling out uh, two, three months be just before. You're going to have to be able to deal with that. You don't want to requalify everything. So, um, and you will find a mix of commercial, defense, institutional customers within the same, say, freight. Uh, and this this is will be absolutely key uh, to mix as much as possible uh, to to increase your filling rates, mm -hmm. so that you can get the gain of of of, uh, of low uh, uh, low price per kilogram. Mm, interesting. And Maxime, on, 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 your, uh, on, on your last question, so it, yes, it's true. Today, we are in some way uh, uh, forced to verticalize pretty much everything. We, we, we even uh, performed the soldering of the electronic board in-house, right? So, but uh, definitely uh, just, just uh, I mean, Jeremy is here. So definitely having a, a refueling capabilities in orbit, just going there as I do with my car, right? So I go there. Uh, refuel my my spacecraft and then move on. Wow, that's 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 great, right? So why should I bring my own tank with a lot of uh, expenditure upfront, uh, all the complexity and, and so on, when I can just take the fuel that I need when I need it and then uh, and then perform my business? So it's just that we are facing a very young market. Actually, it's not it's not even a market, right? So it's it's a it's a market in, in progress. So. Uh, as as uh, as it happened in many other sectors on Earth, this is going to happen in space as well. So it's just a matter of time. And just so, on that, can, can sorry, can everyone hear me a little better? Yes. Um, so so I'll, I'll just speak a little louder. Um, the the way that the space industry is now is essentially like if you were in, in America, in, in New York City, and you wanted to go out west, but there was no railroads, there's no highways, there's no gas stations, right? You, everything is done in a very small area. Uh, you know, there's a joke in, in the space industry that there's like $25 million, and, you know, if you're lucky, you get to hold on to it for a little bit. Uh, and and as, as space logistics grows, as mobility is introduced, right, you know, now you can just hop on a plane and go from New York to California, and it's a five-hour flight. That's only possible because we have a logistics chain for fuel, for supplies, for components, right? And we are at the very beginning. Uh, the docking of MEV-1... In that, that case, like, uh, thank you very much for the fact. UN sustainability goals should be considered as strong guidelines for space activities. Uh, but how do space actors implement them? Okay, I think we had a, another audio loop. Uh, okay, I think we are back. Um, okay, but that's very, very, very interesting. We, we have been spe speaking of a different, um, um, different uh, time scale. Um, so looking forward, uh, as we understand that space logistics is just like emerging. Uh, for you, what is the, the time horizon for space logistics to, to reach uh, maturity stage? So I, I think near term in the next five years, you're going to see a lot of companies go through their demonstration missions, really proving out the space logistics capability, right? And as that momentum grows, you know, I think within 10 years, we'll, we'll have a mature market. Uh, you know, once people start using refueling, uh, I'm, I'm hard pressed to believe that they're going to stop wanting to refuel their spacecraft. When someone's able to inspect their spacecraft to see what happened to it, like, like once all of these capabilities come on and people start getting used to them, uh, it, it, it's just going to proliferate from there. So within 10 years. Within 10 years, okay. Uh, maybe, Jesus. maybe, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll mention just, you know, with, re with, with respect to the type of missions that Astroscale has. Um, so of course we're planning to launch LCD next, next month. Um, and with respect to address J, which is our. Uh, first type of JAXA mission, and that plans to launch in 2023. So 
you're already seeing that there are some type of preliminary de preliminary demonstration missions in the next few years. Of course, as you mentioned before, North America has already launched MEB. I think, you know, before 2025, we'll have things such as ELSA-REM, which is our next generation of ELSA-D. We've got, of course, Clear Space, which I think everybody will find out a lot more about tomorrow. Um, but yeah, I, I think a lot of things are taking off in, in this kind of time frame, five to 10 years, really. And a lot of this, these preliminary missions we're doing, we're developing rendezvous and proximity operations technologies, the ability to actually do that docking, which is effectively necessary and essential for all these future space logistics services. So yeah, that's what I would say in the next five to 10 years. Yeah, and, and also depends on the on the which layer of logistics we are talking about, right? Because now we are focusing on satellite around Earth. So we say, okay, in 10 years we will reach the maturity. I mean, but space is big, right? So the universe is big. So these logistics will keep, I mean, growing with additional services. So today, so I mean, the orbit already demonstrated that, that the satellite transportation is possible. Then there is the other layer of in-orbit servicing. We are going to have uh, Astro scale mission uh, this year. Then we have the first uh, tank in orbit uh, at the end of the year, if, I, if I'm not wrong. So, you know, we are, be, we are building layer upon layers. And, uh, and there will be, as I said at the beginning, so, so many new business models, so many new companies. So today we say space market, but we don't say Earth market. We say oil and gas, uh, automotive, and uh, uh, energy, and, and, and so on, right? So there will be a segmentation in space as well. And logistics is the enabling platform that uh, uh, for all these sectors. Uh, so, uh, people is, is I'm, you know, what we're doing is cool, like Astroscale, the orbit. It, it's really cool. But the thing I'm really excited for is what crazy ideas are enabled when this infrastructure is in place. Because you wouldn't have Amazon if there was no postal service, you know, if there was no planes. And so when these are just commonplace, like what is somebody going to think to do with, with this? And, and that's what's exciting. So to, to space logistics fully materialize to its uh, full potential, um, is there any gaps that we have yet to uh, fully address? Are there, is it about technical, uh, technical maturity? Is it about uh, political and regulation? As of today, it's still uh, almost uh, very complicated to dock uh, with a foreign satellite. Is it about business model? What are your thoughts uh, about this? I think uh, if, 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 if you look at it from a, a volume perspective, um, space logistics, if you're just going to be uh, putting just a couple of satellites uh, or, or capabilities in orbit, um, you, you don't need space logistics for it. But what we see today is with a huge increase, I mean, exponential increase of objects being orbited, um, this will uh, drive also uh, sustainable use of space topics to, to, to get more into the foreground. And for me, uh, space logistics and sustainable use of space are extremely closely coupled mm -hmm. because if you are in a fire and forget model, which we are up to now, uh, you, you don't need all this fancy space logistics. However, the moment you see that, no, I want to be reusing, refueling, bringing back down debris, all that stuff, that's where you need space, uh, 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 space logistics. But there indeed, and that's nice, in the coming five years, we, we will be looking at these main gaps, rendezvous robotics uh, and re refueling all these capabilities. Uh, how, do I, how do I get from one orbit to another? It's, it's not like on, on Earth where you can simply build a side road. Uh, there, there are some physics involved with a lot of fuel uh, necessities. And um, I think, this is the, the, the nice thing about space logistics is indeed, as, as, uh, as you said before, if you start imagining having an infrastructure up there, then the, the, the amount of use cases just starts uh, growing exponentially as well. Yeah, yeah. with respect to gaps, um, I, I think there's a couple of things I could mention. I, yeah, I mean, technology is is a gap that needs you know that, that needs evolving but i think the two key ones i would mention are kind of the legal challenges and the regulation so i mean with respect to regulation i mean it's it's, it's quite immature i mean we're going through one of the first uh, licensing processes for elsa d that has ever been done on a kind of active debris removal mission and you know it, it's kind of the, the first time 
anybody has really gone through this type of process. And I, I remember before in the presentation earlier, they were talking about the complete life cycle of assets. And in a way, you know, what we're doing at the moment, we're launching satellites into space, but, you know, the deorbiting part of that is, is not, you know, is not being fulfilled. People aren't removing their assets after they've failed or, or, you know, their lifetime has ended. I think there should be some kind of stronger regulation to actually uh, prevent space operators leaving assets in orbit. So, yeah, there's the regulation piece, and then there's, of course, the legal challenges. I mean, with LCD, both of the, the servicer and client we're launching, you know, they're owned by us, um, and that, that makes it much easier. But if you want to service um, an asset from another company that's owned by another company that resides in another country, you have the issue of multiple launching states. And currently, this is a very um, difficult legal area. Um, and before logistics can open up where anybody can go and freely service anybody else, whether it be commercial or government or customers, you know, a lot of these areas have to be resolved. Uh, on the top of my head, I, I'm thinking about um, um, position and, uh, and situation awareness. With, with logistics comes the need to know where you are and where you want to go and when other people are. So far, is there enough solution um, to, um, to support uh, your activities in orbit, either uh, with ground-based solution or at some point space-based solution to to monitor traffic, to monitor deployment of uh, your customer, to monitor a rendezvous, uh, and, uh, rendezvous or launch operation? So uh, I just want to give this example. So uh, two, three weeks ago, we, we launched the other cargo in, in orbit and we were within 130 plus other satellites or in a big cluster. And uh, at the beginning, it was really, really, really difficult to. So uh, Norad uh, said, OK, uh, we will wait to provide you the, the, the TLE. And so I said, OK, uh, luck, so you get a bit right. But then you need to, uh, to qualify the orbit and so on. And uh, we were helped by a private company that. Uh, so I think uh, the private sector uh, grabbed already the, the opportunity of providing these services along with the government so we are not yet up to speed so there is only few uh, there are a few companies at the moment but this is another opportunity and this is a, an important need that also uh, so at the beginning we were talking about standards well another standard is communication among companies performing logistics right so we need to speak the same language share information and uh, help the companies that are tracking all the objects in space uh, to provide information timely and especially not just information but provide information that allow operators and space logistic operators to understand when the maneuver is really dangerous or not so mm -hmm. today the like the the sphere of probability is so big that sometimes you say wow even if i move my satellite i'm, I'm not going away mm -hmm. uh, i'm not going too far so uh, and and these are some aspects that definitely we need uh, to improve okay and on the regulation side maybe a big gap is you know we need a fair fair playing field uh, we cannot have uh, certain launching states uh, asking for certain sustainability regulations like uh, and and others uh, being very strictly regulated i think europe is showing really the, the good example in that you know with the uh, ariane 6 upper stage being always deorbited after its mission, uh, making sure that it uh, does not uh, does not become a debris. Uh, we don't see these regulations being implemented as quickly as they could in the rest of the world. And I think this is a very clear example of, of where uh, we need also governments to step in and make sure that this playing field is, 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 is well regulated, clear for commercial companies to do their business in. So we are received. We received a few questions from the audience. Uh, some uh, with, uh, with, uh, about legal challenges. Uh, um, uh, someone in the audience asked um, regard, with regard to legal challenges: Is it uh, going to be the wide, wide west, or is it a, a more window for uh, for innovation? What are your views on this one? So I. With respect to legal side and, and regulation, I mean, Astroscale, I would say, would push for more regulation generally. I mean, there can be, you know, there is a balance to have between over-regulation and under-regulation. There's many countries um, around the world that are trying to 
attract companies and or operators saying we have a very kind of um, lean licensing regulation type approach. Um, the problem with that is I, I don't really think that's, um, that, that really helps space sustainability overall. In order to really consider space sustainability and realize you know, how much trash we're putting in, up in space and not cleaning it up, and the issue that that's going to cause the space logistics in the future, we do need um, greater regulation. And I think that's why a lot of companies that are more sustainable, I mean, I would consider ourselves, OneWeb, others, have come to places like the UK and other places in Europe um, because they understand that there is a regulatory framework that is being constructed. And, you know, as long as, you know, that if that creates a set of rules and regulations you can follow, it's better than not having anything or having a leaner type of regulatory approach. Yeah, also because I think in space it will be very easy. I mean, uh, you know, we, we, we need to be sustainable on Earth, but the, the Earth cycle is way slower than the space cycle. So if we don't, let's say, behave in space, there will be no space and there will be no business for anyone. So I, I think it's very important uh, regulations. But I, I have to say that, I mean, uh, with respect, even just five years ago, right, that uh, five years ago, space logistics was still considered a science fiction. So, uh, but I have to say that today, all the, the, the public entities are really uh, uh, ready to listen to uh, comp companies, research institutes and other agencies in order to find the right way to implement new regulations. Of course, it will take time. It's, it's not easy. So we are not talking about the regulation of a single state. We are talking about regulations of uh, the 160 nations plus, right? So. Uh, it will take time, but I have to say that the approach is very positive, and um, I'm, I'm very glad of, of what is happening right now in, in the community. Thank you. Um, I have the next question from the audience about um, how the launcher industry is evolving. There we see also new launchers, uh, reusable launchers, also emerging, emerging uh, of small launchers. Um, and on the other side, we see that you guys are also developing like a new um, bunch of services uh, up in space. And uh, the question is asking, so is there is this offer from the launchers is enough to, to support uh, the need for you guys to, to be launched in space? Do, do you find enough uh, uh, launch uh, capabilities for you? Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm having like a, a formation this year and uh, uh, six to 10 next year and so on. So, uh, of course, we need a lot of launches and uh, uh, the, the more launches, uh, launches are available, the more uh, the flexibility in the market. Um, as as uh, uh, was said before, uh, the, the entire industry need to change the approach. This is also coming with regulations and everything. So customers are willing to book for launches very close to the launch date. And uh, so launches need to adapt, but the regulations need to adapt everything, right? So I, I think uh, uh, what is happening now is very interesting. Uh, we have also to take into consideration that this phase will last how much? Uh, 15 years. Then it's very likely that most of the spacecraft will be built in orbit. Uh, it's, we, we, we don't build boats on the desert and then bring them on, on the sea. We build them directly on the sea. So in the future, it's logical to think that these assets will be built in orbit. That doesn't mean the space logistics will be over. Actually, there will be even more needs of logistics going, grab satellites, you know, recycle material, and in the future, grabbing some material from asteroids and... Uh, I mean, it, it's really a, a very challenging but inspiring future. Uh, but for the for the next uh, decade or so, I think launches will be one of the most important and strategic assets for whoever works in space. And I think on this, you, you can also clearly make the, the parallel with logistics on Earth, right? We, 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 we've got deep boats, we've got trucks, we've got trains, we've got bikes, we've got cars, we've got minivans, we've got electric cars, we've got, I mean, the, the, there is no one logistics uh, vehicle and it will be like a, a mosaic needing to fit together to make it all work uh, 
and and uh, therefore uh, the, the more the merrier and uh, but we need to make sure we are communicating and making sure we have the right interfaces between each other so that the end customer does not have to book five different vehicles to get from a to uh, to, to b thank you very much for this answer the next question that i have is uh, could it be that technology and the excitement to get into practice is advancing at a faster rate than what progressive regulation can keep up with. It's interesting. So is this logistic a, a technology push or a market pull uh, <laughs> and even a, an obstacle to uh, oh legal obstacle? What are your views on this one? I think the market is moving even faster, right? So, and, and technology is following and regulations are trying to, you know, to uh, build a framework that I think it's, it's not bad actually, because uh, you focus regulation on market needs as, as Jason was saying before. So we don't need over regulations. We need like regulations that actually are able to allow a good business and, uh, and then to foster the growth of the market. So I think we are going in the right direction. Yeah, I mean, I would say that things like a lot of these IOD demonstrations, you got to think of LCD as it's not purely, it's not purely a technology demonstrator, you know, by going through the licensing process, by getting insurance, by doing the spectrum, by going through all of those different things, you know, we're growing those different sectors, you know, the insurance industry is going, the legal sectors to support all these things. And I think that yeah, by doing such a mission and, and a lot of these IODs, you incrementally, incrementally progress both, you know, aspects of technology, regulation, legal side policy. So it, it all kind of grows together. So. Very interesting. So I think we can, I guess we have to, oh. yeah, we can call it a day. Uh, I wish we had hours to discuss and because there are so many other questions raising up and popping up <laughs> on this one. Just to wrapping up, I, assume, I, I understand that space logistics is, is emerging. There is a strong demand and a lot of, uh, and a lot of innovation on the supply side. Several challenges uh, still to be addressed with regard to, uh, to uh, connection between the different um, uh, level of the supply chain. And, but I, I, one question I had uh, at the beginning was how much um, demand um, or how much cannibalization space logistic creates uh, to the existing space industry. I understand that from uh, your answer that space industry will become a space logistic industry at a wall. Yeah, I think so. So there, there will be no, I mean, there will be actually that like new business on, on top of what uh, uh, we find now. So now you have launches mainly, but then the transportation is starting in orbit servicing, active duty removal, uh, refueling, uh, gas stations. There will be way more other business on the top and uh, and we need to coordinate each other so, uh, and to, we, with each other. We need to work together. Uh, we are not yet in a phase in which, in which we are all competing against each other. So that's that's a magic moment. And we talk to each other. We meet, you know, I, I know all this, all, all this phase and uh, we meet regularly at the like uh, round table and, uh, and uh, events and like, like this one. And uh, I think what we are doing today, uh, it's very important because all the ideas and the, and the, and the, and the messages that have been uh, provided today will also serve as uh, inputs for regulators, but also for companies that are entering into this market. Thank you, Luca, and uh, thank you, everyone, too, for this great discussion. Uh, it was an amazing discussion, and thank you, uh, EPFL, uh, for organizing uh, this panel. Um, Emmanuel, the floor is yours to, uh, con to end the day and, uh, with uh, conclusion words. Thank you very, okay. thank you very much. Thank you, Max Maxime, for, uh, for moderating the panel and uh, all the panelists. It was really a great honor to have you here to, to hear your thoughts and, and your vision. Uh, so now we can conclude the day number two of the Sustainable Space Logistics Symposium. We had today a talk from Professor Devec from MIT. He shared his view on space logistics from the Arctic exploration in the 18th century, 1819th century to Moon and Mars logistics, also featuring an experiment from uh, MIT that's going to land in a few days on Mars. We also had a very fascinating talk uh, from Klaus Dorman from DHL. Uh, DHL being a, 
earth logistics expert and also explaining to us, okay, what is really logistics? Uh, what can we, uh, what are we looking after in space logistics? And also how is DHL uh, tackling innovation and how we could also get a, 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 a speed in of their innovation in the space industry. And I'd like also to mention this quote that I really like is that if you want exponential uh, growth, connect, and this is exactly what we're doing today. Um, and I was really fascinated about this last uh, discussion, uh, panel discussion, discussion uh, uh, with on a new space uh, featuring the Orbit, uh, Orbit Fab, uh, Ion Group, and Astroscale. Uh, we discussed what are the drivers of space logistics, um, when is space logistics coming to a maturity stage? So it looks like it's going to be in five, ten years, different type of new business model. Um, how is the uh, space industry going to, is emerging and, and going to be at the shift? And also talking about uh, the legal uh, framework that needs also to grow uh, together with the, the, the industry and the, the capability growth. And this is a perfect transition to what we're going to see tomorrow happening. So tomorrow we're going to have first a keynote uh, from a clear space, uh, one about clear space one mission with uh, Muriel Richard Noka, who is the, the CTO of clear space, uh, clear space being a spin off from uh, EPFL. Uh, so we're really proud to, to have them uh, uh, talking tomorrow. Then we'll have a panel discussion uh, moderated by our partner Secure Work Foundation with Brian Whedon. Uh, on the pathway for developing rules for space logistics. So I really think a lot of people today will have also the answers uh, from questions that were raised today by the panelists. And then we'll open uh, our whole event with a um, discussion on uh, sustainable space legacy for the next generation. Indeed, we are really uh, keen to, to talk about sustainability and also to have the views of uh, our students and the, the younger generation to see what, what do they want, because this is also the word that we're going to leave uh, to, to, this, to this generation. And this discussion will be also um, with uh, Claude Nicolier, the uh, first and only Swiss astronaut. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for being there today at EPFL. Let me remind you that all videos of today are going to be online on our YouTube channel. You can still check the one, check the one from yesterday. Uh, on our YouTube channel. You can follow us on social media for updates. And uh, we're really looking forward to tomorrow for the, the last day of this event. Thank you very much, and I wish you a nice evening.